Hey everyone, welcome back to the Travel Mug Podcast. You may have noticed in some of our recent episodes, especially when we were talking about Europe back in the beginning of the summer, that my husband and I love visiting museums when we go to new cities. It's one of the things that we look for to do when we're going to a new place. That being said, I actually don't know a lot about art, although I love it. So we are bringing on art historian and educator, Anik. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here. Yay. As Um, are we. Yes. Very excited. So I guess even though I am not the one who seeks out museums, I'm going to kick it off because I still would love to understand, like, tell us how you decided to pursue art history and how the Academy of Art History sort of came about. Okay. Actually, I came into art history in a sort of roundabout way as such. I started doing my undergrad at Queen's University and I was doing, of all things, which is completely different, commerce and languages. But I decided that that commerce after a couple of years just wasn't for me and kind of had an early midlife crisis wondering about what am I going to study? What am I going to do with my life? You know, basically freaking out. And then I took a step back and kind of thought, well, what, what do I love doing? What do I do in my spare time? What am I interested in? And it, you know, once I was thinking like that, it came to me really quickly. Art and history was what I loved. So I switched my major to art history, did a minor in classical studies. I did a Venice summer school program through Queens and absolutely fell in love with Italy, with art history knew that was 100% for me and kind of didn't look back after that. I did my master's at the University of Warwick in England and also spent a term living and studying in Venice and then decided that that was, you know, I wanted to pursue that even further. And so I did my PhD at the University of Cambridge. So that's That's kind of my educational background in a nutshell in terms of art. And then I guess when I finished my PhD, I got to the point where you know, I, I was outside of the art world for a little bit, looking to work my way in, in terms of fine art insurance, but I missed being so completely immersed in art history. And so that was sort of the spark that started the idea of Academy of Art History. But I think the driving force behind it was over the years, I had talked to, you know, family, friends, acquaintances, and there was a common theme that always emerged. And that was, you know, people wanting to learn about art came up against two sort of major barriers, I guess, you know, in so many words. One of them was a sense of intimidation, thinking, you know, well, I don't come from an art background. How can I learn about art? You know, the art world is sort of the exclusive, you know, kind of like an exclusive club for people who have learned about art or collect art and whatnot. So that barrier I knew had to be broken down. Mm -hmm. Another one was that, you know, people who want to start learning about art history or build upon whatever knowledge they have, sometimes there's this sense of overwhelm thinking, like, where do I start, you know, and most of us these days turn to the internet, but as we all know, the internet is, you know, can be not very reliable. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So I kind of just, I wanted to create a platform where people, you know, can go to learn about art in a coherent, comprehensive way. I wanted to make art easily accessible, approachable, and and fun, you know, no snootiness, no overwhelm, nothing like that. So that's, those were the kind of the driving forces behind Academy of Art History. Yeah. So I guess to explain even, even further for our listeners, so in regards to it, when they go to your site, what can they actually do? Is it courses for them, sort of like Tell us like what people can do there. So we've got two kind of things. We've got master classes and we've got courses. So okay. the master classes are one-offs. They're like a one-time deal. It's 45 to 60 minutes long and wide range of topics. I mean, I'm, I'm putting one together right now on Edgar Degas' Ballet Dancers. I've also got another one that I'm working on, the biblical hero David, Sculptures of Him by Donatello, Michelangelo, Bernini. And I've also got one coming up super soon, which Jen, you know about, is the ultimate who's who guide, how to identify saints in art. So that's going to come really soon, which I'm excited about. So those are one-offs. The courses are a bit more intensive in terms of that they're three or more modules, again, each 45 to 60 minutes long. What's coming down the pipeline in terms of that is women in art, 
patrons, painters, and portraits. We've also got one on art of the Italian Renaissance courts and also one on the age of Impressionism. So th those are the kinds of things you can go to the site to learn about. Also, those when you do get those, they are available to you for however many times, for however long. They don't just disappear okay. after 24 hours. <laughs> Excellent. No, I love that. And I'm not going to monopolize this whole conversation, but I think this next question <laughs> should also come from me. Um, so I really do want to understand from your perspective, which is an expert perspective, what are some things that people can do to make museum experiences more enjoyable? Some people already love them. So I guess what I'm saying is, as someone who doesn't really love going to museums, I've been to a lot, but I don't love it mostly because I'm impatient and I don't enjoy wandering. So can you sort of talk to us, you know, non-museum lovers, what do you feel we're missing and why should we take the time? And of course, you know, not everything is going to appeal to everyone and that's just life. But I think, you know, if someone wants to become more cultured, what can they do to enjoy that experience, you know, as someone who's coming into it, not loving it to start off? Good questions. <laughs> So basically, I would say that, you know, why museums are important, why art in general is important, and why I think we should all take the time, really, is that, you know, it's not only about the works of art that, you know, that we're looking at. Once you scratch the surface, art can really teach us about different cultures and different societies, different periods in history, different beliefs and traditions. So in other words, it teaches about the context in which they were produced. And I think that really helps us to understand not only ourselves and others and where we came from, our history, our shared history, or our not so shared history as it might be. So in other words, I think art is an important vehicle through which we can broaden our understanding, broaden our horizons. And I think that, you know, in the times that we're living in and the world that we're living in, I think that's a really important thing for all of us. In terms of how to make it in you know, the experience more enjoyable. A couple things I would say, if you're going to a big museum, I know, I think you guys have been to the Louvre, both of you. Yeah. 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 So that's a huge museum. And if you go there and you're expecting to do the whole thing in a day, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> you're going to yeah. have overwhelm, burnout, museum burnout actually is a thing. It's a real thing. So I would say wh whatever museum or gallery you're visiting, go to the website before have a look at their, most of them will have like a collections highlights page right. with, that have their, their major works or various kind of departments or so, you know, Asian art or European art or whatever the case may be. And just make a list of some of the things that you want to see that's on their website. A lot of museums these days have their collections online. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, go and find a floor plan. Again, most of the time it'll be actually on their website. So you can find a floor plan, look at, you know, where the, your list of stuff that you want to see, map it out on the floor plan, and then kind of make your own route, make it personalized, you know, go through it that way. And then if you're done and you, you've gone through your route and, and you're good, you can go, that's great. Or if you've got extra time, then you can circle back and see some other things that maybe you didn't see the first time around, basically. Right. And just quickly, another thing I would say, take a break, mm -hmm. like take a sit right. down go to the cafe, go to wherever, take a break. I do it all the time. You know, it just avoids the whole burnout thing. Cause you don't want it to be some kind of chore. You know, you want it to be something interesting and that you're, you know, you're into and, and whatnot. You don't just want to say like, look at your, your watch being like, Oh God, when, when, when do I get out of here? Kind of thing. <laughs> right. Is it time to go yet? Yeah. Exactly. And I do want to, <laughs> I do want to say we went to DC in 2006 and we did the Smithsonian's, all the different museums there. And I have to say that I, I adored. We had lunch in the middle. We took a break. The next day we saw some that we didn't realize were there and went back to see them. We revisited one and they're not all art oriented, but they're definitely historical. And I have to say, you know, just so I don't sound completely uncultured, I did really, really enjoy our experience there and highly recommend those as well. That's amazing. Funny enough, I've never been to Washington DC before. <laughs> yeah, which those museums. Kind of shocking because there's the <laughs> National Gallery there too. Which, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the Smithsonian's I've heard are really amazing. I've heard that from a number of people. About yeah, that. no, definitely. So yeah, like so much, not as much art oriented, but it was a great introduction for me for someone who doesn't love sort of taking that time to do it. I, I really enjoyed that experience. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I, you know, as a person who 
very much enjoys museums. I think it is really important that you don't treat it like a checkbox to check off on your vacation visiting these types of museums. I do I love wandering like that is my favorite part so like wandering through a museum is really fun for me my husband and I tend to treat museums maybe a little bit differently he really likes to like read the plaques and that sort of thing and I more prefer to just kind of like take them in and what works that like get me whether I get them or whatever I go in and kind of zoom in and read the plaque maybe a bit but I kind of prefer to take sort of the step back view and kind of take it all in that way too. So as far as like kind of tackling a museum, do you recommend people get audio guides? Is that something you like to do or how do you kind of enjoy a museum? So I think that basically when it comes to audio guides, it's really, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's personal preference. Mm-hmm. It depends on whether you absorb information more, you know, if you hear it or if you read it basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain audio guides that you can get that literally walk you through that will say, go into this room, turn right, go and stand in front of this work, and then it'll, it'll talk about it. Or, you know, you can stand in front of a painting that will have a number on it and you press the number or go to the thing and, and, and it'll do it again. Some, some will literally just be an audio guide of the info plaque, like word for word of the info plaque. Some will elaborate on that more interestingly, I was in New York city at the beginning of the month and I did, cause I, I don't normally do audio guides. I'm, I'm the type that I, I tend to enjoy wandering on my own and kind of creating my own experience and path through a museum. But what they do, what they're doing nowadays is like, there's a QR code. Um, okay. And, and so the museum where I was at had one of those right by where I bought the ticket and you just scan it with your phone and it takes you to the website or the audio guide website of the museum. And you just plug in your ear pods or what, whatnot and just kind of go from there. And some of them I think are paid, some of them are not, but that's something that you can look into yeah. either when you get to the museum or email them you know, before and, and ask. So again, yeah, I would say it's personal preference really as to how you absorb information really. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love the QR code idea because I don't love the like step-by-step walk into this room, turn left, do that. Like that's too structured for me. Exactly. Yeah. But I love the idea of being like, oh, this piece is really interesting. I want to learn more and being able to like scan a QR code and go through on your phone because I I know I felt kind of old fashioned because that was one of the first times I had seen it. Yeah. I don't don't normally. I'm hearing of it. So I think, you know, about 2022. Because I, like I said, I normally don't really go for audio, but I was just curious as to, as to what it was. And I kind of asked the guy, I was, and he goes, oh no, you do that. And I thought, oh God, tech technology. Yeah. <laughs> but it was actually really good because it's just, it's just your phone and your own earbuds. You don't have to right. get or do anything else. Yeah. I like that. I do. Yeah. So speaking of museums, let's talk about some of your favorite museums and maybe some particular favorite pieces of art. I will say some of my favorite favorites have been MoMA in in New York City, the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum in Glasgow, and also the People's Palace in Glasgow too. And I really liked that one because it was kind of like, it was the people, the lay people kind of history instead of the like royalty history that you get a lot in um, art museums. So that one was really cool. Uh, Of course, the Louvre cool but extremely overwhelming and massive as well definitely Um, and then here in Nova Scotia our little art gallery of Nova Scotia in Halifax is lovely it's small but it is really cool to see stuff in your own home and of course the Maude Lewis house is in there and that's just like really cool I think and I think that's great I think that you know sometimes we we think when I do I'm guilty of this when I think of museums and stuff I think oh out there like Europe or somewhere else or something and and you don't really realize what's local and I think it's great learning about you know local history local culture supporting local museums and galleries I think is really important as well um as for the museum, funny enough, I was, like I said, I was in New York. I did not go to MoMA. No? No, because I sort of ran out of time and there were things on my list that yeah. were 
sort of higher than MoMA for me personally. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I did actually, I, I did, I have been to the Calvin Grove, which is oh, beautiful, yeah. beautiful inside and out. The really. building is like spectacular. Like, it's yeah, it's stunning. Oh, so beautiful. I loved it there. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful building. Yeah. For my favorites, I, that's really tough. Yeah. I would say that's, the big museums, like, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I love them for the breadth and the quality of their collections. So, you know, like the Louvre, the Musée d'Orsay, National Gallery in London and Washington, the Met, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Those museums are really amazing. But also I do love a couple of smaller museums as well. And they're not, they're not tiny. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're not, they're not tiny, but I mean, compared to, you know, yeah. Aluga, yeah. they are smaller. Yeah. One of them is the Borghese Gallery in Rome. It's a collection that was actually amassed mainly by one family and it's housed in the Villa Borghese, which is one of their, was one of their residences, um, stunning building inside and out. And you know, has a, a again a, an astounding collection, mostly Italian Renaissance and Baroque, which is is right up my alley. <laughs> um, I mean, they do have other things, but that's kind of you know their bread and butter. Also, another amazing one was uh, is the Wallace Collection in London. Again, a mass mainly by one family housed in what was their, they call it a townhouse in London, but really it's, it's like a mansion. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I can imagine. Yeah. And just an amazingly varied collection, everything from paintings to drawings, prints, armor, metals, coins, everything. And it's just, it, it, you, the rooms aren't small, but you get that kind of cozier, more intimate feeling when you're walking through those kind of things. As you guys have been to the Louvre, they're, they're like massive, <laughs> massive rooms. Yeah, um, so it's yes. kind of nice walking through a museum where there is that more intimate feel to it, for sure. Yeah, I love that. Any places on your bucket list that you haven't been to yet? <laughs> so oh. many. Yeah. So many. I think like everyone after COVID, I would be thrilled to go, you know, just about anywhere really. But I would say that Europe, Europe, anywhere in Europe, to be honest, is kind of top of my list because, you know, I lived there for a number of years, just the culture, the history, the atmosphere. And then of course, when it comes to museum and galleries, you're, you're pretty spoiled for choice over there. (laughs) I said this on our, on my trip report episode I think so we were in Scotland and what I love about the UK is a lot of the museums are free and so it's really accessible to everybody and then I also like the fact that when you're not paying an entrance fee at least for me I don't feel guilty if I don't see the whole thing Mm -hmm. because I know like I've gone to like museums in New York where you're paying this entrance fee and I'm like I feel like I have to see everything to make right. it worth it and then I'm like forcing myself through a museum to get your money's worth <laughs> to get my money's worth right. and then it feels more like a checkbox and I hate that so I love being it being accessible in the UK that you can if you have an hour you can go in and like look at a couple of rooms and then leave like it's just I love that about <laughs> yeah no, that is, that is an amazing thing. And obviously like they, these museums that are and galleries that are free do have funding to make it that way. But I don't know, you probably noticed like they have donation, donation. boxes. Yeah. And yeah. Stuff. For sure. And I think that's really important. Like whatever anybody can like a couple dollars yeah. or a yes. couple pounds or yeah. something like that, because yeah. that helps it. It's part of what helps keep it free and accessible to, to everyone, which yeah. is, you know, a really important thing. Absolutely. Yeah. They even, uh, even if you don't have cash, they had tap. You could tap. Oh my gosh, they did. I haven't seen that. Yeah. It's, uh, oh, that's brilliant. Scotland. So it was, it was super easy to cash that you could, you could tap. So that was really nice. And I think, I think the tap was automatically like five pounds. I don't think you could choose the amount with the tap. Okay. Like, it was still definitely worth it. And that's really- amazing. What was your favorite place in Scotland or like oh. museum gallery wise? Um, I know I'm putting you I on the spot now. I would probably say like we really enjoyed the People's Palace. Like we just had a really, really nice time walking through there. The building's really cool. They have gardens outside. And then it, it was it was really interesting to learn about the history of Glasgow from the perspective um, and through art of 
the the lay people, the kind of normal people who were living through that time. So that was really just really neat to to learn more about that because when you're reading stuff it's more about like royalty and the richer people so yeah. it's nice to to remember that not everybody lived like that. exactly right yeah. yeah no a lot mostly the opposite actually yeah <laughs> mostly not everybody is rich so. <laughs> so I mean, think your tips especially for people who don't typically go to museums in terms of viewing art were excellent because I do think part of it for me is overwhelming and I'm just like going room to room and I'm just like oh my goodness there's just so much going Does on it become a, a, a blur after a while? yeah it shouldn't and it deserves more attention but because you're overwhelmed you're just like oh what next so <laughs> Is there anywhere else, you know, of course, outside of go to your courses first is my, my <laughs> advice, but besides that, is there anywhere else you would recommend or anything else people should do just to sort of, you know, start, you know, learning more about art? Yeah. So some, some of the bigger museums and galleries will have, you know, comprehensive websites off the top of my head, the National Gallery in London, for instance, they actually have art, you know, terms and periods and a description of it on their websites. I mean, I think that's, that's the biggest thing I would say is go to museum or gallery websites and have a look at that. Also, there are some art journals that are online as well. Some no, some of them are free, I think, or you can look at art, art journals in, in libraries and stuff. What I will say is that, see, if you're going to a website from, from a gallery, or if you're going to look at journals, you know that what's being produced is by people who kind of know right. what they're talking about. Yeah, um, sure. There are some times where I've been on, you know, the internet, just having a look at stuff and there'll be stuff that people say, and I think, oh no, that's not, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not really yeah. correct. Yeah. <laughs> so you just, I think you just want to, whatever source that you're using, you just kind of want to make sure that whoever or whatever, whatever institution is giving you that information has the credentials and mm -hmm. the knowledge sort of to bet, to back it up really. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I think that that's I, a really yeah. big key. <laughs> I took your kind of, I think probably an early iteration of your identifying saints in art course. Yes. And I loved it. I, I honestly did. And I still use it. Like I still, I mean, and that was gosh, two years ago, I guess. Oh no, my which gosh, is that's so scary. So crazy at this point. But like, even now, two years later, I have looked at pieces of art and remembered things and I kept able to go like, oh yeah, like this. And it's just, it's really interesting. Yeah. And I, that's what, so when I did that, when I, when I, you know, when you saw the early version of that yeah. <laughs> and stuff, that was, it's one of the most kind of things that people like, you know, have, have said to me since I yeah. talked about saints, it's something that, you know, it's not super complicated. It's not over the top. It's not, that's what I mean. Like you can dip your toe into the art world. You can learn about stuff. Yeah. You can develop your knowledge. It's not like some far out there you right. know, type of thing. Yeah. You just need to do it in a kind of comprehensive, coherent, you know, step-by-step -step kind of way. Yeah. And uh, you can absolutely do that with art, with, sorry, with saints and art, because I know sometimes, I mean, you know, when you go to museums and stuff, a lot of, a lot of uh, Western art is, you know, Christian subjects and, and Christian yeah. figures and whatnot. And sometimes you'll see a painting and be like, wow, I have no idea who this, who this person is or who these yeah. people are without looking at it. But, yeah. you know, once you learn what to look for, you can even tell who's, who's who without even looking at the information plaque or anything like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that sounds to me and, and Jen, you would know you took the course, but it's, it makes art more accessible when you have those little tidbits of information of what to you know you're actually looking at I think would make a lot of difference it makes yes. it more exciting and makes it yeah. more, you're looking at it and you're like oh my gosh I know this <laughs> right? I'm so smart look at me <laughs> <laughs> I've, it's so funny but when I first started out in, his, in art history I felt the same way I'd be like oh I really like this painting and it's it's a beautiful painting or it's a beautiful sculpture or whatnot but oh, I don't really get it and then once you start right. you're like yeah it's exactly it's excitement you're kind of like oh no but I know that I know like this. I can look yeah. at that <laughs> that is cool and I I do want to shout out to you as well because you have like a 
free glossary on your website that people can download too. So you can kind of start dipping your toe in, in art there as well, and just kind of learn some terms. And I love that. Yeah. yeah. I'll that... make sure that that's in our show notes as well. So people. Can Amazing. Yeah. And grab Gotta that. know the lingo. Yeah. <laughs> and start <laughs> learning about it. So yeah, I guess to wrap it up, can you just share where people can find you online, social media, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. So the website is academyofarthistory.com. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Love um, that. <laughs> yeah. And so on that website, like we said, we have, there's master classes, courses, sign up details for that. Also gift vouchers we're going to have for when we roll out, rolling out the master classes and courses. So gift ideas for anybody who's in, interested in art or art enthusiast on your list, et cetera. We have private events as well. So that's all on the website. We're also on Instagram, same thing, academyofarthistory.com and on Facebook as well. Yeah, yeah, all of that will be in the show notes so people can just click on it and go follow you and start learning more about art. Amazing. And I'm really excited. This was a really fun episode and I just want to oh, yeah. go visit more museums now. That's the thing. <laughs> that's that, that's what I want in life. It's just people to just go out and, you know, have a look at art, appreciate it. And also you don't have to like everything. No. You don't no. you can, you can be an art enthusiast. You can get, you know, get some culture in you and whatever. You don't have to like everything. <laughs> at all no, I mean, I think funny enough I'm an art historian and people kind of expect that I like and and am into all kinds of art movements and artists and everything like that and the thing is it's just not the case no I, mean, I think everybody no. has different different type of art that speaks to them more than others and that's totally completely normal I think exactly no it, well it's like anything in life for sure you're you're not going to enjoy everything exactly. <laughs> whether that whether that's your specialty or not you're not going to love everything and so Thank you so much. Like Jen just mentioned, this was really fun, a very different kind of episode for us, but I think one that works so well as people travel the world, that's something they can weave into their travel plans and get excited about. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge and your information with us. Like Jen mentioned, everything will be in the show notes. So we do appreciate that. And as for us, as always, you can find us on our website, travelmugpodcast.com, on Facebook and Instagram at Travel Mug Podcast. To support the show by buying us a coffee, put something in our little travel mug, and there you go. And <laughs> you'll have access uh, through that to fun bloopers and stuff. Also, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts if you enjoy the show, also on Spotify. Or just like share the show with someone who loves to travel as well, really helps us grow. So until next time, thanks for tuning in. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.